Hey, everybody, this is Noah Aperbach Katz. You may remember me as Rin on Star Trek Discovery Season 3, and you are listening to Trek Untold. Hello and welcome back to Trek Untold, the Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I'm your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. The Andorians are an iconic part of Star Trek lore, but they're a group who didn't get much attention after the original Star Trek series and didn't see any action again until Star Trek Enterprise. An honorific race who glorified militarism and commended honesty, Andorians have big emotions that can change on the drop of a dime. They're a fan favorite who haven't had a ton of on-screen representation, but that's starting to change in modern Star Trek. Today, we're speaking with Noah Averbach Katz, who Star Trek fans will remember best as Rin from Season 3 of Star Trek Discovery, a very important Andorian who left a lasting impression among the fanbase. Noah appeared three times as his character, first in Scavengers, followed by The Sanctuary, and finally his last appearance in There is a Tide. Outside of his time in Trek, Noah has spent much of his career on stage performing around the country in theatrical performances of a few different shows, including some we're going to discuss today. Noah is also a very lucky man because his wife is none other than Mary Wiseman, aka Ensign Sylvia Tilly, also from Discovery. The two met while studying acting at Juilliard, and Noah will share their love story today with all of us to hear. Best of all, Noah is also a huge Dungeons & Dragons guy, and in fact, he's the dungeon master for a special private group of Discovery actors who all play together. We get the inside scoop on his D&D sessions, his time in the makeup chair, and much, much more. So get your antenna up and ready to enjoy this chat with Noah Averbach katz But before we jump into our interview, I want to ask you, are you following Trek Untold on social media? It's the best way to keep up to date on who's going to be the next guest on Trek Untold and to learn all about the other cool things that are happening here. So if you're on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, go ahead and look up Trek Untold, all one word, and give us a follow and a like. If you'd like to help support the show monetarily, go ahead and check out teespring.com slash stores slash Trek Untold to check out some of the merchandise we have available. This includes t-shirts, mugs, phone cases, sweatshirts, stickers, and a whole bunch more. So go ahead and check out teespring.com slash stores slash Trek Untold. You can also support our show by visiting patreon.com slash Trek Untold. If you become a paid subscriber to Trek Untold, You'll get first access to the show and a chance to ask our guests questions on future episodes. But most of all, please subscribe to the show wherever you're listening to it or watching it. And if you've already done that, please also leave a review and a rating if you can. Leaving ratings and reviews helps increase the visibility of podcasts on platforms like iTunes and other places like it. It shows that you're listening and that you like it, and that other people who are interested in the same subject are going to probably like it too. It helps us grow, it helps us get better guests, and it helps us keep bringing this amazing Trek Untold show to you. If you're already following us or have supported us in any other way, thank you, of course, for being a part of the Trek Untold family. There's a lot of Star Trek podcasts out there, and we're very grateful that you chose us to listen to. I'd also like to make a quick shout out to our friends at Triple Fiction Productions, who make some great 3D printed Star Trek inspired toys and replicas for fans of all ages and toys of all sizes. But you'll hear more about them a little later on in the show. Now, without further ado, let's beam up this week's guest. Computer, access interview file. Hello and welcome back to Trek Untold. Now joining us on the other side of the screen, his face should look familiar to you, although normally it's covered in blue on Star Trek Discovery. We're chatting with Noah Averbach Katz today. Noah, how are you? I'm doing really, really well. Thank you for having me here today. I'm excited to be here. I'm super excited to chat with you because you've been super fan friendly to everybody online. Uh, you know, the minute that Rin popped up on Discovery, everybody was talking about him, and you've been just so willing to chat with anybody out there. So, you know, before we can get too deep into this interview, I got to say thank you so much on behalf of all the fans for how gracious you've been to this community. Well, you know, I'm still shocked that anybody would want to chat with me. So I'm happy to, <laughs> you know, my hailing frequencies are open because I'm, you know, I'm a fan too. So I'm just like, yeah, whatever you want to talk about, chances are I'll have some sort of opinion on it. So, uh, you know, uh, more than happy to. It really has been my pleasure. And it's been great to, you know, just receive so much positive feedback from that little internet fan community. And I'm looking forward at some point in hopefully the nearer future rather than later to kind of getting to do that all in person. I think that'll be really fun. 
Oh yeah, it's been far, far too long, far overdue to get people back together. But you know, once we're out of the pandemic and we're so close now, once we're out, it's gonna be convention time, and it's gonna be wait. like a bacchanal out there. I cannot wait. I'm so excited. <laughs> so let's just start with the first question. I like to ask all my guests on this show. And Noah, what's your earliest memory of Star Trek? Oh boy, you know that's such a that's such a challenging question for me because like. Star Trek was a part of the household, like pre-memory, you know what I mean? So, you know, I, I remember watching Voyager uh, with my mom when it was on and watching reruns of Next Gen because Voyager was sort of in its run when I was like old enough to like watch TV, you know what I mean? Uh, and uh, Jan had already finished. So, you know... It really is some version of, you know, getting all my friends together and watching Enterprise at some point during this, during the run, you know, it's just so early that it's so, I don't, you know, it's funny, I don't have like that one moment where somebody's like, oh yeah, that's it, you know, that's the moment. It's just like, it's just always been around, you know. Now, can you tell us where you were born, who your parents were, and what did little Noah want to be when he grew up? <laughs> uh, I am from Fairfax, California originally, which is in Marin outside San Francisco in the Bay Area. My parents both came from the East Coast and then moved out West in the 70s. And you can draw whatever conclusions you'd like from that. And, uh, you know, I was always in acting and theater, you know, doing plays in middle school and elementary school and high school. Um, and then even into, you know, undergrad, I was still doing theater, but it wasn't really until I graduated undergrad and got into Juilliard and went to Juilliard that I was like, oh, maybe I could do this as a profession. Um, the rest of the time, I was just sort of like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing, but I'm having a great time doing it. So, yeah, you know, I, I didn't really have any, it wasn't like I had sort of this laser focus on, oh, this is what I want to do, or this, I want to be on Star Trek. You know, it was just like, it just sort of uh, picked me up in the stream and just kind of kept washing me down until I was in New York in 2011. And I was like, well, oh, maybe this is what I'm doing now. So I read that your dad is in publishing and that your mom was a psychotherapist and your mom is, in fact, the actual the Trekkie here among the family. Uh, so, yeah, what's it like growing up in that household? <laughs> Yeah, you know, my mom, uh, hi, mom, she's I, I guarantee she's listening or watching to this. Watching I know this. his mom. <laughs> she sort of loves that idea of like a, a, a utopia, but not like a dystopian utopia. You know, I feel like so often the uh, the way that a utopia is portrayed is like sort of like as a fascist state that uh, portrays itself as a utopia. Whereas like in Star Trek, what is really unique about its utopia is that people still have problems. They still have conflicts. Things are not all solved. It's really just like a lot of the um, the ills of capitalism have been removed and allow people to kind of be their most authentic uh, self, you know, and not worrying about, you know, sort of the Maslow's base needs. Um, and I think that that really appealed to her and to her sensibilities. You know, she grew up watching the the reruns of TOS. And then from there, you know, uh, just kind of kept up with Trek. And, you know, I, I went to my first convention at eight years old. She just threw me in the car and we drove off and I didn't know what was going on. And was, I was like, pretty like oh, okay this is really weird this is really weird but i think it's also kind of fun you know what i mean uh you know and there's lots of shopping to do which is always great um and then after she threw me in the car she would just start throwing my friends in the car uh and we <laughs> my friends who would know even less about star trek would be like this is the weirdest thing i've ever done but i'm having a good time i gotta say you know and they would i have photos of my friends in the uniform wearing the little vulcan ears so she just sort of was like this is just happening i want to do this and you're doing it with me and it it stuck you know once it's in there that young there's really no escape from it and i, I find it kind of funny too that your mom is the trekkie your dad is completely removed from that world but then, you know, fast forward to Star Trek and, you know, we should mention that your dad, Stephen, he's the publisher of Mother Jones, that's which correct. is a pretty well-known magazine. And, uh, you know, here's Rin basically playing a character. It's almost like something out of Mother Jones magazine. <laughs> he basically rises up with the workers to unite against Osira. 
Yeah, I love that. Yeah, he's very, he's, yeah, he's, he's, he, he if, in a, you know, probably the reason he tried to escape the chain is he wanted to just start like a, a, a union somewhere and, <laughs> you know, just, just advocate for, for better wages or for, uh, you know, a more humane tr treatment of Quajon and it all went south from there. So yes, that's very fitting. So along the way, Noah finds himself at Juilliard, uh, amazing school. Uh, can you tell us maybe one lesson that you learned that continues to stick with you today that you use whenever you're on stage or on screen? <laughs> okay. Um, gosh, one lesson I learned at Juilliard that still sticks with me. You know, I think the lesson I learned there that still sticks with me is that so much of so much of what was fun about working on the show was about connecting with uh, the other actors, especially with David, you know, really getting locked in with him on that first day and um, and just really finding a lot of uh, personal connection, both to, you know, the character, but to the moment and and, um, and just really making it a special moment for yourself um, and not worrying so much about what everybody else is going to think about it, if it's right or wrong, if, you know, this is the way that somebody else would do it, but just really focusing on what is exciting about it for you and being really present in that moment and enjoying, you know, the fact that you're here and that you get to be doing this amazing thing and, you know, all the random lucky coincidences that led to this moment and just really savoring that and, and being present for that. I think that would be what I got from that. That's a pretty great lesson to have learned. Uh, and we should, of course, mention that Juilliard is where you would meet the person who would become your wife, Mary Wiseman, <laughs> this is also true. known as Sylvia Tilly on Discovery. So uh, but you, but you guys, I read, didn't actually start dating until a few years after you knew each other. So that's uh, you know, correct. That's what this courtship process was like here. It's a long term <laughs> thing you got going on. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, Juilliard's like it, it's a very small class. There's only 18 people. It's really intense. It's very enclosed. And so you know, it, 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 we both were coming from other places and you're sort of like getting your footing in this new world. And then slowly, once you, you know, come to realize that uh, it's going to end and that, you know, there's a world outside of this tiny little building, then you sort of start to expand your horizons and, and realize that, uh, you know, there are other things going on. And, and that's sort of like when we both really connected and, um, and kind of never looked back after that. I read an article, in fact, from the New York Times that talked about the moment where it first kind of clicked. Uh, do you recall that story? <laughs> what, what did they say? Was this when we were doing a scene together? Is that what we said? Yeah, that's what that's what they allegedly yes, said. Is that yes, true? Yes, uh, I think. <laughs> yes, I think the the official narrative is that we really clicked doing a scene for Macbeth. <laughs> The official um, quote unquote narrative. Yeah, that's that was when the, the sparks started to fly. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that is there's definitely a lot of truth to that. You know, we had great scene chemistry, um, which, you know, unsurprisingly translated, you know, to uh, to behind the scenes as well. Well, not to get too mushy here in this interview, but when did you know that she was going to be the one? Well, you know, I knew for a while. Um, pretty early on, you know, I, I, I was pretty clear on it, but, you know, we had talked about getting married and, you know, she uh, ha is having this great theater career, making, you know, $330 a week. And I'm working regionally a couple of times a year, making, you know, similar money, but doing it in Washington, D.C. and Portland, Maine. And it was just very challenging to like see, well, you know, how are we going to afford a wedding? How are we going to afford, you know, that part of married life? Uh, in kind of the way that that we, or at least I had envisioned it. Um, and then when she booked Star Trek, it was like, oh, that problem is solved. We have some money now. We can we can throw the wedding we want and have a great time. And, and so once she kind of got that job, it really was allowed us to sort of make a pretty big step forward in our life, which was amazing, especially for an actor. You know, it's a, a really, really big deal. I had read that you also helped her out with that audition because that was, you know, quite a thing. You being the Trekkie here, so uh, what was that like? Well, actually, let me back it up for a second first. Uh, at what point did Mary actually learn that it was for Star Trek? Because I know that's usually a hush-hush kind of thing. You know, it was funny because 
it's hard to remember, but like when Star Trek was sort of restarting, there actually wasn't a huge amount of buzz around it. There was just like, oh, they're starting it up again. Maybe I think Brian Fuller is attached to it. Maybe not. But there wasn't like, oh, here's the thrust of the show. Here's what's coming. Here's what to get excited about. It was just sort of like background noise. You know, CBS All Access hadn't even started yet. So it really didn't feel like uh, what it feels like now, which is like, we're back, baby. You know, we're doing it. It felt like, oh, yeah, you know, like this might come around in like five or six years or it might never happen. So when she got the script, it was like that. It was like, hey, that's really a neat thing. And the script was like, you know, uh, very basic. There wasn't like a lot of like, you know, juicy information, I think probably on purpose. Um, so it wasn't like I was reading the script being like, oh my God, I'm getting like the Star Trek feel and we're talking about this and blah, blah, blah. But I was still really excited and, and obviously wanted to help out. Um, the way that it happened was she did what is called like a self-tape for those who don't know. It's essentially just make the audition at home and send it in. Uh, and, and her agent's office in New York has like a little booth. So we went into this booth and I read the lines with her and she was obviously amazing. And it was like, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really need to help you with the acting stuff. You know, you pretty much got that down. So we did it and it was fun. And and we didn't hear anything for a while. Or she didn't hear anything for a while. And then they, um, they got back to her and they uh, asked for what is called a slate, which is essentially just like a full body shot to see like what you look like. Um, which is super, super common. In fact, she probably just had forgotten to put it on the first one. And uh, this, is the, this is where I really stepped in, which is the way that I tell it, I tell the story, is that she's going to do this slate. And so she was you know, getting dressed for it. And she, she came in, I set up the camera. She came in wearing this really loose, flowery, you know, summery, dress very long and loose fitting and flowing you know very very um impressionist blowing in the wind kind of dress and i you know i would i never you know she obviously has way better style than me she's knows way more about just about everything than me so but this one time i was like look sweetie i would never ever you know this is this is the one time ever going to say this but i just think it would be a really good idea if you maybe put on something with a bit more square shoulders, a bit more military, a bit more, you know, in, in the army kind of thing. And she's like, yeah, sure. The way that she tells that story is that she came in wearing this dress and I said, absolutely not. You need to change immediately. Are you out of your mind? Um, so the truth is probably somewhere in between or she's telling the truth and I'm lying. Um, but she did the slate and then we didn't hear anything for a while. And it was like, okay, you know, that's sort of how it goes. You send this video off into ether and, and it, and it's gone forever. And you never think about it again. And I was out at dinner with my cousin and my dad and she, Mary was coming to meet us from somewhere. And me and my dad were talking and my cousin were talking and uh, she sits down next, everybody says hi. And she leans over and sort of just like whispers to me. was like, Hey, I booked Star Trek. And I was like, what? what are you talking about? Like, what do you mean? She's like, yeah, I, I booked it. And I was like, I can't even, I don't even understand what you're saying to me. Like you're on one episode, you're what? And she's like, no, I'm a, I'm going to be a series regular. And it was just like, it took a really long time for me to be able to truly comprehend that information. Um, and then from there, it was kind of a, a bit of a whirlwind, you know, everything sort of changed from there. Well, I'm hoping one day I can get Mary on and get her side of the story, too, because I, I want to see if I can match the two together and figure out which one's the truth, which one's not here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, knowing the two of us, I'm almost certain that she's telling the truth and I've created a new memory for myself. Well, it's a good memory. I'll go with it. So, you know, we know that you did also a lot of work in theater, a lot of work on stage. And uh, I wanted to ask about one role in particular I read about, uh, and that was that you did a theater, a regional theater performance of My Name is Asher Lev. Mm. and. The reason I'm curious about that is because, you know, I remember reading the book and being affected by it and also wondering, just even years later, still thinking about it, why was this never made into a movie? Uh, you know, because I feel like it's, it's like the question. perfect end that'd be great for it. So I'd love to hear about your experiences uh, working on that show. That's so funny. Yeah, it is a good movie. You know, I don't think it would it would get made into a movie nowadays, but I could really see it as like getting made into a movie in like 1998. It really yeah. has that Oscar 98 feel. It was great. You know, it was really an interesting thing. You know, for those who don't know, it's essentially about a orthodox, it's, it's an adaptation of a book 
about an Orthodox Jewish guy who wants to be a painter and paints these, uh, you know, these these pictures, which are beautiful, but which also are very, uh, you know, ostracize him from his community and his family. And they're always at at ends with each other. Um, it was great. You know, I, I think one of the <laughs> the one of the things I really liked was, you know, getting to learn more about the Hasidic community and that life and how different and uh, uh, strange it is. I mean, I'm not trying to pass judgment, but I'm a Jew. So whatever, you know, I'm going to do it. And, you know, it was interesting. At the time, I lived in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, or Washington Heights, Brooklyn. And the, um, you know, the community that 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 uh, the play and the book is based on is maybe 10 blocks down. So walking down there, getting to look at this, you know, where the, you know, the religious leader lived and walking through that community and being like, you know, wow, I'm just walking into a completely different world. It's just a very interesting um, culture. It's a very interesting, you know, weird uh, little subset of America of the, these religious communities that have sort of uh, decided to, you know, stay separate, um, which, which, you know, is, is, is kind of their, they have every, every sort of major religion has their own little subset of religions who are saying, you know, I'm staying away from everybody else. We're doing our own thing. And it's just a really interesting thing to learn about. And this was before that, uh, that Netflix show came out uh, that got really popular about like Hasidic Jews and that woman who's trying to escape. And yeah, it's, it's a, it's, it's just a really, really interesting culture and a, a challenging one as well. Good way to put it. Yeah. Good way to put that. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't at me. Don't tell me I'm Jewish. All right. You know what? I'm, I'm keeping it inside the family. Okay. <laughs> So, you know, a lot of folks we've spoken to have come from the world of stage as well, and then they transition into screen, typically happens. Uh, so during your time that you've been working in the theater, was there like one show in particular that really taught you a lot about your craft or just about yourself? That's a good question. I was doing a play uh, right before the pandemic that I was actually doing in conjunction with Star Trek called uh, Richard, Dick, Sally, and Jane, something like that. I can't even remember anymore. Uh, I did it in Baltimore. It was going to move up to New York, um, but it got canceled because of the pandemic. Actually, our rehearsal was going to be on the Monday when on Friday, the entire city locked down. Um, and it was just a really interesting uh, moment. It, first off, it was just a really great group of people. You know, often you'll have one person who you're friends with forever or, you know, you'll have a group of people you get along with and then they all scatter to the winds. And if you're very unlucky, you'll have somebody who you really don't like in a play. You know, it's a, it's like any other job. It's just you have a lot of different ones. You know, sometimes you like your coworkers. Sometimes you don't like them as, as much, but you always try to do your best. Um, and in this one, it was just it was a uh, uh, just a really, really great group, both from the cast and the creative uh, side the writer director Noah and Taylor were really amazing and and it's been great to still keep in touch with them and you know there was a lot of things about that play which really stuck with me first off you know it was about um, a lot of it had to do with being deaf and we had a deaf actor um, who was amazing Trishel, um and having interpreters and other deaf people uh, was a really really just a special experience for me, you know, as somebody who is, you know, has a physical disability, but whose community is a little bit more scattered, is a little bit more, you know, on the internet and less in person, like, uh, and a little bit less cohesive. Uh, it was just really, really, it was just a really special thing to get to see a really cohesive community like that. Um, and it really, um, I just learned a lot about, you know, what's important to me in, in, in that world. And, and that sort of has really informed, you know, me trying to get more involved with type one international and insulin affordability and that stuff. So it was really an inspiring thing. And, and it's a special thing to get to be around because that is not an experience that a lot of people get to have. And then also to kind of shuttle back and forth between Star Trek, you know, this massive production and I'm wearing all these, you know, costumes and makeup and da 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 da. And then to come back to this play, which, you know, requires uh, a lot of energy and a lot of focus, but is, you know, just a completely different tone 
um, it was just a really fun thing to get to bounce back and forth. And as opposed to them sort of being, you know, at odds with each other, like, oh, I have to get my head back into this one. It really felt like they complemented each other and this sort of level of, you know, camaraderie and uh, collaboration that I was sort of practicing in the play I could bring up to Star Trek and the level of focus and sort of, you know, physical determination to make it through the end of the day I could bring back to the play. And so it was just a really, really fun time. You know, you it's so rarely are getting to work at two things on once without it sort of driving you crazy. Um, so it was just, it just wound up being a really, really special moment. And, you know, uh, I'm glad that it was that that happened before the pandemic and not something really bad, because uh, that would have sucked. <laughs> Trek Untold will return momentarily. Trek Untold is brought to you by Triple Fiction Productions. If you're a Star Trek cosplayer looking for props or a toy collector looking to spice up your shelves, Triple Fiction Productions has you covered. Triple Fiction Productions produces affordable and unique 3D printed Trek inspired products from the original series, Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager, Enterprise, and the movies. You can expect the same amount of care and attention to detail in any of the items in their catalog, whether it's a prop replica for use in a fan film, or a part of a cosplay, or accessories and playsets for figures from Playmates, Migos, or Diamond Select. Own your very own tricorder or phaser rifle with working lights, the bridge of the Enterprise E for your Playmates figures, or any other item from countless species and ships from the Star Trek universe. All products are 3D printed in the USA and are constantly evolving and improving based on fan feedback. To learn more about their products, visit them at triple-fictionproductions.net or on Facebook at facebook.com slash triplefictionproductions. Triple Fiction Productions taking Star Trek where no 3D printer has gone before. Hi, I'm Jonathan Frakes. If you're of a certain age, you may remember me as Commander Riker from Star Trek The Next Generation. And my wonderful brother Daniel died with pancreatic cancer 24 years ago. They opened him up, they diagnosed, they said, you've got six months to live. And that was it, he died four months later. And at that time, there was a 3% survival rate. Since then, we've grown to the embarrassingly high number of 10%. But a dear friend of mine, and probably all of yours, Kitty Swink, is one of those 10%. She has survived pancreatic cancer for 17 going on 18 years. Pancreatic cancer is the third leading cause of cancer-related deaths in the United States with a five-year survival rate. That's just 10%. And more than 60,000 Americans are estimated to be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in 2021. More than 48,000 will die from the disease because symptoms are often vague and be hard to detect. That's why I'm supporting the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, the leading patient advocacy organization committed to fighting the world's toughest cancer. PanCan is working hard to create outcomes for this devastating disease through its groundbreaking research in early detection and better treatment options. PanCan drives progress by funding life-saving research, providing personalized patient services, and creating a community of supporters and volunteers like you who will stop at nothing to create a world in which all pancreatic cancer patients will thrive. You can help support our important mission by donating today at pancan.org. Thanks for your time. We now return to Trek Untold. So Noah, let's beam into our Star Trek discussion here. We've got a lot to talk about. So, uh, you know, first things first, you know, as you mentioned, we were discussing Mary. Uh, typically, the audition process is very secretive. So in your case, you kind of know more, you, you feel like you might have some more of an idea of things as opposed to other people, but uh, had you previously auditioned for any Star Trek roles before this? Yeah, I auditioned for uh, Spock early on. Um, and when that script came through, they do uh, like a code names or whatever, and they code name this guy, Tom the Andorian. Um, and I remember reading it and working on it. 
it was the scene where it was two scenes. It was one where Michael and Spock are sort of meeting up for the first time, I think. And then the second scene is when Spock is sort of losing his mind and talking about Alice in Wonderland. And I remember reading these scenes and being like, there's no way this is an Andorian. This is a Vulcan. This is Spock, I'm sure, you know, and everyone was like, no, no. And it was like, I got it, you know, and uh, it was just really fun to uh, get to work on this genre, which I knew so well. Uh, I feel like it was really, it really informed me of how to play these scenes because especially that, um, that uh, Alice in Wonderland scene, if you don't really have context for it or you don't really have the genre for how you might approach something like that, it's kind of gobbledygook, you know what I mean? And so having a really solid foundation um, about you know, how, to, how to approach a Star Trek script, how to approach playing a certain species, you know, even if they don't tell you, you know, you kind of just know right away. Um, it really, it really was just a lot of fun. Um, and so it was great to get to do that. And they really liked that audition. And then they, you know, obviously Ethan does an incredible job. I'm so happy that he's doing that and has to deal with the stress of trying to be Spock and not me, because I think that would have killed me. I would be dead trying to, you know, live up to those expectations. And Ethan does such an amazing job. Um, and then when, when Rin came around, I actually flew, I was in Toronto and I flew back to New York to audition in New York. And again, you know, it was like immediately I just understood the world and I understood, you know, the stakes and I could just picture myself, you know, on a, on a broken down space station. You know, it just didn't take a lot of effort to figure out what the hell was going on. It was like, I don't know what, you know, the greater context is, but I also know like sometimes in, in Star Trek, you start there, you know, you just are there and it's the actor's job to just convey, you know, that cold open where you're, you know, O'Brien and Bashir are trying to rig a, an explosive device to escape from the Cardassian, you know, and you don't, you don't need to, you know, you, you don't know everything that's going on, but it was, it, it had that feel. It was almost like I was doing a cold open of an episode and it was just really, really fun. And, and, uh, and yeah, and then that was kind of that. So when did you discover that uh, Rin would be a recurring role? And more importantly, uh, when did you find out the ultimate fate of Rin? Yeah. You know, I made a decision pretty early on to not really get too involved in what was coming or what was happening because one way or another, whether it's one episode or 50 episodes, you know, he comes to an end at some point. And I knew that if I had in my head, this is going to come to an end at this point, I would be so distracted and disappointed that I wouldn't actually be able to do the job that I wanted to do and focus on how things focus on the acting and, and it being exciting and having fun, you know, in that first episode, I, uh, you know, I, I read it and he's running and then he gets beamed up. And then in the end he's on sick base. So I'm like, well, I'm definitely coming back for one more, you know, that's, I'm definitely coming back for one more. And then in the, in the next episode, uh, or maybe it was actually in that same one or, whatever uh you know in the call sheet you basically have like a list a, a call sheet is like you know basically everyone who cast crew who's involved but the, the the whole cast is essentially listed and given a number so that way when you're doing uh you know scene six you have number three number four and number one and a lot of the time you know not that there's like a re a, a perfect system but generally you know the most important people are given the highest numbers and as you go down you know the there are less of important people uh, given, given the higher numbers. Um, and I think I knew I was going to die when I was number 45, 46, which is fine. Uh, but I realized I was going to die when grudge was number 22. And I was like, Oh no, if this cat is higher than me, if this bastard cat is is a higher number than me then there's no way i'm sticking around longer than a couple of episodes so uh so i i knew it was coming which which gave me some peace you know i really really got to soak in every moment that i was there i wasn't sort of 
on my toes, tense about waiting for, you know, the bad news. So when it finally did come, it was like, oh yeah, well, I knew this was coming. And you, you, you know, Star Trek well enough where you're like, you know, who's going to make it or not. You know, one way or another, you know, whether or not they're dead or they go off in another ship, you know, to another quadrant, you know, when somebody's going to make it. And I was like, this guy, he's not going to make it. <laughs> but he had a great time while he was doing it. And, and to be fair, you know, Grudge is a queen, so it's not surprising she would get top billing. Yeah, it's it it's uh yeah, I, I understood, you know, I, I wasn't too angry at it, uh, but it was very clear to me, you know, where the priorities lay. So there you go. So in preparing for this role, you know, you being the Trekkie, did you go back in time and watch any old episodes of things like, now I'm, I'm wondering in particular if you checked out Enterprise, because that has Shran, Jeffrey Combs, as probably, I think, the most well-known Andorian uh, in the franchise up until Rin has shown up. Uh, did you go ahead and, and watch any old episodes? Yes, I watched all of the episodes uh, of Enterprise with Shran. You know, it. I consider, like, even though they're in Journey to Babel and, you know, it, it's such a weird thing, Andorians, because... They are so iconic, you know, their imagery is super, super iconic, but there's so little lore about them or, or canon about them, you know, whereas like the Klingons or the Vulcans, it's like literally books are written, you know what I mean? But you have, you know, Andorians just as early in Journey to Babel, you know, and so I really considered Jeffrey Combs's performance, you know, even less than the writing, because even in the writing, there are some canon building stuff like the other race in Andoria or like, you know, little things, but there isn't like, you don't go into, you know, the political structure of Andoria that much. You don't go into, you don't see the Andorian, you know, uh, town square and how their culture works and stuff you really get what an Andorian is and how it's different than a Klingon or another sort of aggressive race from Jeffrey Combs's performance. You know, you, you, you get a sense of this sort of like brash, confident, uh, in your face, no backing down, uh, 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 culture, but that is also as, as that performance progresses throughout the season, you you really see a lot of sensitivity, a lot of deep feelings, a lot of big feelings, um, and a lot of uh, emotional, yeah, just emotional sensitivity, which I think is all based on his performance. And so I, I tried to, I watched all of his episodes and tried to just think about, you know, how to incorporate that in, in my performance. You know, obviously the the situations are very different. You know, it's super far in the future, as opposed to meeting Shran, who's this sort of legendary commander. You've got Rin, who's sort of at the lowest rung. So I just tried to, you know, try to osmose as much as I could of, of, of his performance. And and I sort of consider him sort of the, the Andorian. So when we're talking about the character, the personality of Rin, you know, this is a character who I think his story is told through much of his actions and a little bit of their dialogue. But I'm kind of curious if you created a much deeper story for the character as you prepared to play him. You know, that's an interesting question. I didn't do the kind of actor thing where you write, you know, your five page backstory, blah, 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 because it didn't really seem necessary. You know, it's pretty clear when you pick up what the general um, idea is. The things that I did fill in in my mind are, you know, his relationship to Osira and her uh, her sort of responsibility in removing his antenna and that experience and what the point of that experience was for her to him. So, you know, that way, when I talk about Osira or when I encounter her or when I'm warning people about her, I in my actor head had a real story of, you know, what made her so dangerous, you know, that that she I, I've seen her, you know, I, I think in that last scene, other than Gareth, uh, uh, that character, like nobody has spent more time with her and knows what she's capable of. So it really did feel like, you know, when I gave my final you know, my little last speech that 
I knew what the result was going to be. You know, I wasn't underestimating her. I was making a decision to make this my stand as opposed to acquiescing and going back to whatever life I had. So in, in, a little bit of both, you know, there was the, the, the moments that were really tied to, you know, what I had to do uh, and my relationship with the other characters. That, that's where I really put a lot of that energy building up the story. Um, because, you know, the, the backstory of him had changed and sometimes they put something in, other times they took something out. So I didn't really get too focused on, you know, what his uprising was rather than, you know, that it happened and it failed. I think that's the important part, you know? So let's talk about that makeup for the Andorians too, because Rain has got a heck of a makeup. And, you know, we talked to Ian Lake a little while ago who plays oh, yeah. Ryan Alien, and he told us about that process. And there's that video on his social media as well, showing it, which was much more intense than I would have ever believed. But uh, yeah. what was it like for your makeup session? Uh, yeah, me and Ian were in the trailer all the time together. Uh, it's really, really wild. Uh, you know, it's especially strange for the Orions because it's like it looks like the contours of their face are human. It's just green. And so it's a little bit shocking to like be like, oh, you're wearing a mask over that. It's, it's, it's very funny. But for the Andorians, you know, it was a lot. It was a lot. So the way that that, you know, those masks work is they're kind of full face completely over your head back of your neck there but like maybe four different pieces kind of glued together you know some stuff that i didn't understand was first like when they come there there's essentially they're made in this mold get a mold of your face i'm sure everybody has seen that that before and then uh when they're on your face you know out of the box they just look like a sort of sky blue color it looks like a really really crappy halloween mask and the way that they give it a sort of lifelike personality or lifelike look is essentially by hand painting it. So they will sort of airbrush multiple la layers of colors, multiple textures, and then they'll come in with an actual hand brush. And it's really like a piece of art, you know, turning this, you know, essentially lump of rubber into sort of a real face, but it takes a really, really long time. Uh, and then, you know, they'll glue the wig on top. Uh, and, you know, in the first episode, I had this beard, this kind of, you know, prisoner stubble. And the way that that was applied was essentially strand by strand was glued to my face. And then they took scissors and actually trimmed it up to my face. So these long strands that they, they trimmed it. So that took a really, really long time to do. Um, and <laughs> that is one of the reasons why he loses the beard after the first episode, because it added a lot of time. So, you know, in that first episode, combination of the beard and also combination of finding, you know, uh, through trial and error, finding the most efficient and uh, way to paint the mask, you know, to make it look good. It took about five and a half hours to get it done. Um and that time, you know, you just uh, sit there. You can't really talk because people are working on your mouth and your lips. You know, you have a lip piece that they glue onto you. You can't listen to anything because your ears are covered and people are sticking things in your ears so you can't hear anything. You can't read anything because they're painting, you know, on your eyes. You have to keep your eyes closed if they're uh, airbrushing over it. Uh, and, you know, the, you can't, you just can't really see anything. So you just kind of sit there for um for five and a half hours. And then, you know, the other thing I didn't understand w until, you know, <laughs> whatever, until I started was that at the end of the day, when you're finished shooting, they cut the mask off. You know, it takes a while to, it takes about an hour to take it all off because it's essentially glued to your face. So they have to, you know, very slowly kind of rem remove this glue. Uh, and then they throw it in the trash and you start from the top the next day. Uh, which is like sort of shocking the first time you realize that you're like, wait, you mean we have to, you're just starting completely over. Uh, but yeah, by the end of it, we got it down to a pretty smooth three and a half hours, which is pretty good. And for somebody like uh, Doug Jones, who uh, doesn't have hair and uh, his mask, you know, because it's this sort of pale color and doesn't have as much texture, the painting goes a little faster. He can get it done you know, he also, you know, he, sh the reason why he shaves his head is because they can just glue the mask to the top of his head. I mean, he's such an incredible pro that like, he's just like streamlining it as much as possible. 
Uh, so he can get it done, his mask, I feel like in in like an hour and a half, maybe. He can really, really blow through it. He's a pro. Did Doug ever give you any pro tips on how to survive being in the chair? Yeah, well, wearing that mask throughout the day is a very challenging physical experience. It really um, taxes you. It's, it's a really taxing thing. You're, you're, you're just like under this constant stimuli. Um, and your body is very, very confused about what is happening because it's sort of like I, I, my uh, what I felt is like my body thought that I was slowly being devoured head first, um, you know, like like I was in the the body of a giant squid that was constricting your head, you know, because it is it's very constricting, you know, you, you the the glue is on super tight. It's just a very, very um weird feeling and it makes it really difficult to do anything you know difficult to focus you, you can't really hear anything because your ears are covered and then eating is really challenging everything is super challenging walking is super challenging because your eyesight is 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 obscured and you know uh, uh doug was just really helpful about you know how to act in the mask you know uh, both from from some from tips he gave me and also from just watching him, you know, because the mask is not super responsive to the subtle facial uh, feature expressions that that one might do, you know. So if you want a big, you want an expression conveyed, you really have to uh, over accentuate your your facial feature under the mask and that will come through as like almost normal. But you also have to be really careful about not overdoing that because it's very easy for it to really start to um, look like you're wearing a mask. You know, it's it's very easy to reveal the fact that this thing is not responding in the ways that you'd be used to it responding. And so, you know, it just kind of learned from him where to go bigger and where to keep it small. You know, the, the one thing you do have going for you in these masks is that if you're if you are doing something smaller and you know a, a facial expression that is is smaller might not be conveyed these masks are so they have so much character you know they they tell such a story that a lot of the times just seeing the mask and hearing the line will convey a huge amount of the story and you don't have to you know make a big facial expression to kind of telegraph uh, what you're feeling. So, so just from watching him, I think you can see in his performance, you know, uh, when he, when he's choosing to do a bigger thing or when he's choosing to do something smaller. So, so I just thought that was really, really helpful. And, you know, I think ultimately anybody who does mask work, the, 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 um, the advice is just like, survive, you know, <laughs> you just make it through to the end of the day, you know, and it's not for everybody. Uh, I was at a like a cast party last year, pre-pandemic, um, and the actor who who plays Linus Ben, he came up to me, and um, it was after I'd done some work, and he's like, "So you're you're one of us?" And I was like, "Well, what do you mean?" He's like, "Well, like, in order to do this mask work, you have to be an insane person." And I sort of, and he like looked over at Doug, who was like making some ridiculous thing in this, you know, doing something ridiculous. And I thought back to like the other people who had worn the mask, you know, and I was like, yeah, that tracks that, that really, really tracks, you know, you have to be a little bit crazy to do this because it is, it is a really, really intense experience, you know? Yeah, it definitely presents a very unique challenge that not a lot of actors really get to have to deal with, essentially. And uh, like you said, a lot of things change. You have to work differently to emote. You have to focus more on body language. Like we spoke to Ava Blackwell, and she told us that for her in particular, body language is very important. Uh, but, you know, in, in terms of Rin, one of the things that I picked up about his character kind of reminded me of Armin Shimmerman's portrayal of Quark. Mm -hmm. And that's how he always has these very sympathetic eyes. And I always felt like Rin had the same kind of sympathetic eyes. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, at what point did you become conscious of how the makeup was on you, and how did that help you ultimately develop the personality of Rin? That's such a good question, and any time I can be compared to Armin, I'll take that <laughs> as a massive compliment, so thank you. You know, that that's uh, totally spot on. You know, really early on when I was working with David uh, in the first episode, I, you know, it, it was like, well, what, you know, I don't know what to do in this thing. I, I don't know how to get this to work. And just uh, like in the first few scenes of watching David, 
he's such a talented uh, performer and actor. And it was very strange. I'd be like, I'd be on set with him and he'd do something. I'd be like, what? And then I go over to the, the playback and, and watch the scene back. And it was like exploding off the screen. And I was like, how the hell did you do that? Like, what is this? What's going on here? I need to figure out how to do that because like it is, it is totally happening in this amazing way. You know, David has these really large eyes and it's not that they're, you know, of course they're expressive, but he really is focused on communicating a huge amount of story just uh, with those subtle eye movements where he's looking, what he's, you know, just just being there and you can just really see into his eyes. And I thought, well, why don't I try that? I don't really have much else to work with here. So like, what if I just try doing that? And going back and watching playback, it was, it just was immediately starting to click for me. What's, what's challenging is that it, it's great to, you know, use body language and use big facial movements, but you know, that that's, can be really useful as like a Klingon who has these big moments. But when you're playing somebody with a real challenge, you know, you're playing somebody who is beaten down, who has to remain quiet, who feels small and contained and like they are, have been, you know, put into this very small box. Um, it's a real challenge because you can't, you know, have a big, you know, big thing, arm movement, whatever, to kind of convey that story. So, so I really tried to focus on, you know, just trying to convey the sort of emotional story through the eyes, not try and worry about manipulating the mask too much and just let the mask sort of tell the story of his struggle or his, you know, what he's been through, that sort of battle wearied person that he is. Um, and so I just just tried to really focus on telling that story through the eyes. Uh, and um, it was, you know, it's just a really interesting acting exercise, you know, to have things taken away from you um, and really be forced to simplify. It's a, it's just a really, really interesting exercise to get to do. I, I, I really, really enjoyed it. And yeah, you know, it, it, it's funny because even the eyes have have these really thick contacts in them as well. So it's, you know, there is something even still where it's like really, you know, where do I look? When do I look? You know, because even the, the 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 eye movements around the side of the eyes where the dilation of the pupils isn't there. So it was it just really, you know, even even with those contacts, they're so blue and so vibrant that you just project a story onto them. And so, you know, the sort of hope was let me do a little bit of work and see if the audience can kind of meet me halfway and fill in the rest of the story. And since we're talking about this part happening during Scavengers, I want to actually follow up to you on that because at the end of this episode, it's a very action-packed climax. Uh, was this the first time you'd ever done something to that magnitude of craziness? <laughs> Definitely. You know, so that was my second day of shooting was on set of Scavengers. And we didn't do the ending. We just did the, the second day of shooting was, um, it's actually like a really short moment, but it's sort of where we're running out of the, uh, the the work area into the kind of gravel and there's the explosions and you know I had never done anything like this it was you know it was basically an action movie and so I'm still trying to figure out how much this thing weighs my head down you know trying to figure out how to run uh, there's 40 extras who I'm supposed to be leading up this gravel and then down this gravel and then you know the, the guys are like hey so so like five feet over there, you just can't go over there because there's going to be a huge explosion. And if you get too close, it's going to melt that plastic onto your face. So just make sure to stay away from there. And then another time, you just make sure to go around this. And then also like there's all this scrap metal on the ground. So don't trip on any of it. So it was just a crazy, <laughs> crazy way to start things out. But it, it was also just so much fun. You know, I think there's no, I'm not, I'm not acting in in those scenes like I am focused on truly not dying truly not getting blown up you know I didn't have to do any extra work to believe like I was there because if I was out of it if I was like I don't really believe this then I would have fallen into a jagged piece of metal and impaled myself or I would have got blown up so I was you know just like laser focused it was just so much fun you know it was it was such a unique experience that uh I mean, there's, there's I, I doubt I'll ever do anything quite like that again. Um, but it, it was, it was really, really, really fun. 
And then moving ahead to your next episode, The Sanctuary, uh, that was the time you got to do a scene with your wife. Uh, so I'm curious, that was the first time you guys had worked together professionally since like maybe your Juilliard days. Was was that the first time on a paid gig, I should say, that you guys were yes, working together? Yes, yes, yes. It was definitely the first time on a paid gig we had worked together. And I was so nervous because, you know, I had to represent the family first off. And I was also it was very clear that I was in her house. You know, she was so comfortable, so relaxed. And it was also just really interesting. You know, we hadn't really done anything too significant together in a really long time and I was just blown away by how relaxed she was how in control she was it was um it was really really impressive and a great reminder of why she's just absolutely out of this world good but it's funny because uh <laughs> you know I I was so excited and a part of me really wanted there to be a Tilly Rin romance you know and 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 uh even if even if it wasn't in the script, it was in my head. And so I came in really ready to give it to her and just like, you know, oh, we're going to have this, you know, this drag out back and forth or whatever. And uh, I did it. And Jonathan Frakes came up to me and was like, listen, Noah, like you need to like bring it way back. I don't really know what you're doing. It was very nice, but it was like, you need to calm down. And I just couldn't believe it. You know, I was like, oh my God, I've blown it. What a horrible day. This is it. Jonathan Frakes told me I suck. This is the worst day of my life. And I was just like, well, let me just try and survive the rest of the day. And Mary and I were leaving set together. And I was like, well, how was your day? And she's like, oh, it's terrible. And I was like, what, what do you mean? What happened? And she's like, well, I was like going to come in and like, do this big argument scene with you. And Jonathan Frakes was like, you need to chill out, Mary. You need to relax and pull it back. So, so both of us had sort of come in ready to absolutely just like go back and forth towards each other. And it was completely not the scene at all. I Watching the final product, I'm like, oh yeah, it's a good thing he did that. Or it would have been like, what is going on? Um, so it was just, it was really funny, but it was just a lot of fun, you know? And and I had been on set so much, you know, I knew everybody knew me there. I, you know, I was the, the guy who loved Star Trek, who would show up all the time and get so excited about this. And, you know, the props guys or the set guys would, you know, show me the thing they made, look at the prop, look at this, look at the costume. Gersha would show me her costumes and I was just so excited. Um, and so then to get to kind of step to the step on the other side of the camera, especially on set, you know, everything else had really been on location. And so this was sort of the first time on those sets. It was just a, a really, really awesome experience. I'm glad to hear that. And we should mention, since you've mentioned, of course, Jonathan Frakes, two of your episodes that you appeared in were directed by him. So did you have to fight being starstruck the entire time? And, and yeah, what was I it? did. And how would you describe his <laughs> style of direction? You know, I was, I was very, there are some benefits to wearing this mask. And one of them is like, you couldn't really tell. I was totally like, like just my knees were quaking, you know, I was so <laughs> nervous, you know, I was going to be like doing it in front of him. And, and I just like, I hope he likes me, blah, blah, blah. And so like, I was obviously acting like an idiot the whole time, but because I was wearing this mask, you like really couldn't tell, you know? So I was very, very thankful. Um, he was great. You know, he's an amazing director. He really has this kind of rare combination, which, which is a rare for especially TV directors, which is both really, really understanding the technical side of things in a way that I certainly don't, you know, how to set up a shot really well, how to change on the fly, uh, how to like make your day, how to not fall behind schedule and understand that, you know, falling behind schedule is almost worse than not you know, then getting the scene half good or whatever, you know, but then also with a real ability to talk to and appreciate actors and acting, you know, which is a lot of the time gets lost, especially in TV stuff, because, you know, you're coming in and you don't really know the characters or, you know, uh, you don't have as much experience working with actors. You're, you know, you're, you've practiced film and, and editing, but maybe not working with the real life people. And it's difficult to understand why, they won't do exactly what's in your head, you know, uh, but with Jonathan, he, he just really gets it. You know, he, he just really, really is able to talk to actors. And then on top of that, when he's on set, there is just sort of this, um, he just has a great energy, a, a really, really, um, you know, everybody just wants to sort of do it with him. You know, he, he's just a real leader and, He's also able to, you know, make jokes about Star Trek and talk about Star Trek with a sort of authority, which is just so much fun. You know, nobody's really going to question him and and his ability to kind of poke fun at it is is just uh, amazing. It's, it's it was it was a lot of fun. And I was just so lucky that, 
you know, when I think back about on the experience of all the things that went right for me, you know, having him direct two of my episodes is, uh, is really, really just lucky. Now, spoiler alert, your final appearance happens in uh, part of the season finale. And, uh, you know, me as a viewer, I got to say it was a little bit anticlimactic for me because, you know, I had a feeling since day one that Rin wasn't going to make it out alive necessarily. I actually thought he wasn't even going to survive uh, scavengers, but happy that he did. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the way that things kind of ended up for your character, I was expecting Rin to go out in more of a blaze of glory. And the way he kind of goes, it's just kind of like, well, poof, he's gone. Uh, and that just made me so sad to see him go out that way. So, you know, I'm curious, you know, did you like the way that Rin went out? Would you have wanted something different to have happened for that character? I mean, I wanted him to live forever and have his own spinoff show. Of and, course. You know, whatever. The I, Rin and Tilly adventures. Yeah. You know, I don't think uh, as an actor, as an actor, if you really care about a character, I don't think you're ever happy regardless of sort of how they go. You know, and I think in the moment I was, of course, you know, well, you know, on, on the day on set, it was my last day of shooting and it really did feel like it, especially on set, it sort of, you know, everyone got very quiet. There was just sort of reverence and David, you know, really, really was in that moment with me. So it really did feel like there was something, at least for the actor, maybe not for the viewer who wasn't there, something really cathartic and something really final about it. So I guess, you know, for me, I didn't sort of feel unfinished. I really felt like that was my final day and I got this amazing send off and everyone was there. And, you know, it, it felt it felt it felt final for me as the actor. You know, I think a lot of people were surprised or disappointed. I get it. I mean, sure, you know, who doesn't want more of me, of course, you know, especially my mom. Um, but I, I also think, you know, as time has gone on, what I really liked about it is that his redemption arc and his end is abrupt and that a lot of the questions you have about him are not answered i feel like in star trek so often in a good way you know you just know everything about everything you know i think that's what make it makes it fun you know everything about every culture every ship you have the layout you have the blueprints that's awesome i love that but it also makes it really special when something comes along and you're like wait a second like that's all we know about him. Like, what about his time in the Emerald Chain? Like, how did this go? Who is, you know, who who is this guy? You know, and so I actually like that his story is cut a little shorter than you would like. It kind of leaves you wanting more. It leaves you with more questions. And it also leaves you feeling like, oh, you know, like his, his redemption arc um, is tragic you know, because he doesn't get to go out in a blaze of glory, you know, but, you know, he still gets to go out on his terms. So I, I like that it's just not sort of tied up in a very neat, tidy bow. I like that it's, it, it feels unsettling and a bit like, wait, no, that's like, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want that to happen, you know, and I feel like that sort of unease is something that, I don't know, I, I kind of like as opposed to like, well, we're done with him, you know, bye. It really makes you feel like, ah, like I wanted more of that. And, and I, that's a good, that's a good feeling for me as opposed to, yeah, we're done with him. I mean, to be fair, you know, I do believe that while I didn't necessarily like how it ended, uh, I do appreciate that Rin did have that redemption arc and that he really did have his own hero's yeah. journey essentially from start to finish. So he did have yeah. a complete arc. Uh, I just kind of wish he had done a little bit more because, you know, I loved Rin so much and who didn't. Of course, of course. I mean, absolutely. And we know that everybody loved Rin too, because I know, you know I was watching on social media. All the Discovery fans are coming, flocking to your pages. You've got so much <laughs> fan art of Rin now. Yes, uh, I you know. know. But the thing is, there's there's basically a clear divide between Star Trek fans. There's like one side that likes the new Trek, and one side that absolutely loathes and hates it with a burning passion. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know why I bring this up is because oftentimes I've seen that your wife Mary is constantly on like the attack from all these horrible trolls. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, you know, what's it like for you as her husband to just basically see her have to deal with this all the time? Uh, it's it's really challenging, you know, it's really challenging because I know all of the amazing Star Trek fans, you know, I know what they're like, their sort of compassion, their care, their interest, their excitement, their community building, you know, I've seen it, I've been around it, I've seen how they take care of each other, how, how especially, you know, 
when I was going to conventions when I was younger, this is all pre-cosplay. This is pre-nerd culture. This is a place where people who who didn't feel like they quite fit in in the rest of the world felt like they could fit in there, you know, and and there was nobody was excluded from that. You know, I think that's a lot of uh, part of the reason why my mom felt really comfortable there is because, you know, this weird, goofy side of her personality was allowed to have free reign at these conventions and people loved it and they appreciated it and everybody just felt really seen and appreciated. And so having these negative experiences um, is, it sucks because that really colors her uh, opinion of Star Trek and of the fandom. And, and she's well within her right, you know, obviously to, to do that. And so it, it's really too bad that people think it's acceptable to behave that way, that they think that, you know, there's some sort of, yeah, it's, it just, it just uh, really, really sucks um, because as much as I would like to sort of, you know, show all the amazing parts of Star Trek, it's very clear to her that, you know, Star Trek and this fandom has some really serious issues. And it makes you not want to be a part of it. It makes you, as the actor, say, you know, screw this. I don't want to get involved. I don't want to put myself out there to the fandom. I don't want to interact. I don't want to engage. Uh, I want to, uh, you know, be done with this. Um, and that's a, that's a crappy feeling for anybody in any job. And it just kind of reminds you of like Kelly Marie Tran during the whole uh, Star Wars thing that happened, you know, a few exactly. years ago, saying they were yeah. basically got chased off social media just because it was yeah. just overwhelming. And it's it's horrible that this still happens here, you know, 2021, and there's just still so much unnecessary attacking and trolling like that. Yeah, it it really is too bad. You know, I I just don't think I think I I don't think people understand like how that that you know people read this shit. You know, they actually are, you know, you're being a fucking asshole, and people are gonna read it. Uh, and, um, you know, fuck those people. That's enough said about that. Let's move on to something more positive here. <laughs> so everybody who I've spoken to that's been on Discovery has said it is the best set they've ever worked on. Did you have that same experience? Because it sounds like you did. I, I certainly did. You know, I, I think what is, I mean, look, it was an easy sell for me, to be honest. You know what I mean? It, it wasn't going to take much. Although, you know, there is this moment I had where it's like, oh my God, if I don't like this, if I have a bad time here, like this is going to suck. You know, it sort of is like, it, I really, really wanted to be good or else it'd be like, oh my God, you know, I finally get to reach this apex of my life and it absolutely sucks. You know, you hear about that story. It's like, I've wanted this thing forever and I finally got it. It's horrible. So Thankfully, that wasn't the case. You know, I, I really think uh, so much of that ethos is is the cast. You know, the cast is so amazing. There's sort of no bad apples. Everyone really takes care of each other and listens to each other. And I think that, of course, comes from the top down with Sonequa, who is like really, uh, she is absolutely committed to being a a lead by example cast leader. Um, she is like utterly inclusive of everybody who is on the show, whether you're an episode or whether you're somebody's husband like me, uh, just a really, really amazing person, amazing leader who, you know, absolutely set the tone. And I think everybody was happy to sort of fall in line with that sort of um, mentality of, you know, uh, camaraderie and taking care of each other and listening to each other and taking everybody's concerns really seriously. And, uh, and I, I think that really comes from her. And of course I can't let you go today, Noah, without discussing what our viewers who are watching this on YouTube can see right behind you. That's a bunch of D and D stuff. Uh, so for folks who don't know, yeah, look at all that beautiful stuff right there for folks who don't know, Noah is the dungeon master for the discovery D and D game. Disco goes D and D. Uh, so can you tell us the story about how that all got started? Who's a part of it? And, uh, Give us the latest update on what's going on with the current missions. So I've been playing for a while and I actually wanted to start a game last season. Um, but because I was flying back and forth for other jobs, it just didn't really happen. And over the kind of off season, especially during the pandemic, I had seen that Anthony had posted something about playing D and D, and I was like, "Hey, Anthony!" And he was he was gung ho. And then Blue had there was a group text in the, in the off season about, um, 
you know, what the hell are we going to do if we can't hang out? You know, how are we going to have fun? And Blue maybe, uh, Blue texted like, well, we can play D&D and Noah can uh, DM it. And the timing is just right. You know, I, I think one of the sad things for the pandemic, which is true for everybody, is that you lose the, the camaraderie, you know, the, the parties getting to hang out with people is such a fun part of being on set, of being a part of this, because it is challenging when you're up in Toronto. Toronto is beautiful. It's great. But you're away from home. You're away from your friends, your family. So not being able to, you know, part of the fun is, is getting to hang out. And so, of course, that being uh, not the case this year, it made it really challenging. So I just think um, d and is sort of filling that gap. It gives you a chance to be around people, not talk about work, make up stories that aren't about work. You know, uh, it's a real departure and it's given me a chance to get to know Blue and Ian, who I didn't know very well before and now know really well and, and love them. And um, yeah, it's just been a lot of fun. So the group is um, Anthony, Mary, Blue, Ian, Anthony's fiance, Ken and Emily Coots. Um, and Blue had played before, uh, and Anthony had played a little bit before, um, but they're like, everyone is like, they know how to play D&D now, which is very, which very much warms my heart. You know, as a DM, you are hoping that you sort of inspire people to uh, dive deeper into the, you know, depths of D&D &D and rules and the player's handbook. And so I feel like that is slowly happening as people are like, you know, what's the best combination of spells I can use in this, you know, and, and they're getting excited about it. So it makes me really, really happy. Um, when When is this going to come out? So for folks who don't know, by the way, I record my episodes well in advance. So today is March 16th. So, yes. uh, you know, we're going to get a little bit of an inside scoop here. This is not going to air for at least six to eight weeks, most likely after we do this interview. Yes. So, so when this comes out, this will be old news. But between you and me, uh, this week, is Sonequa's birthday and her and her husband Kenrick were like hey could we like play this weekend for her birthday so uh I'm going to um build some characters with them tonight and then this Sunday we'll do some sort of I don't know if it'll be birthday theme but it will be for Sonequa's birthday uh like a D, &D sort of one-off episode um this will be old, old news by then but you're getting the exclusive in the future so i'm really looking forward to that sonequa has really really expressed you know she's wanted to play she's expressed interest she's so busy she's got two kids a newborn you know she's like doing she's obviously working to working herself to the bone as she always does but i'm really excited for her and for kenrick to get to you know have a few hours to uh, play this stupid game and have some fun with us so i'm, I'm really looking forward to that so that will be what's coming up next so I saw Anthony rap on an episode of Loading Ready Runs Dice Friends, and they did an episode uh -huh. of like they were doing the Honey Heist role playing game, and he sure. was playing it as a grizzly bear. It was hilarious, and he took it very seriously. Uh, so you know, who amongst <laughs> you in this session like is, is taking it that seriously and making up their own voices and really like becoming the characters? Oh, you know, I think everybody. You know, it, it's amazing when you have actors playing this game because that the role playing aspect is just second nature. You know, it's just like oh, this is just what I do. And actually, I think actors really take to this game because it's it's in a lot of ways the, the freest expression of acting because no one is dictating what you're supposed to do. So you get to create your character, act your character, and then decide for them, which is so usually not the case. You know, somebody has written the script and they tell you what to do and you kind of work it out uh, and and figure out the best way to do what has already been written. So it's no surprise to me that all of the kind of actors have really taken to it. But, you know, Ken has really found his Tortle character um, very well. And yeah, Anthony, <laughs> I'm, I'm not surprised that Anthony took uh, playing that grizzly bear very, very seriously. That sounds very much in line with his character. I'm sure he was amazing. So Noah, last question for the day. What is the best thing about being a part of the Star Trek universe? Oh my gosh, the best thing about being a part of the Star Trek universe. Oh my God, there's, <laughs> you know, uh, what is the best thing about being part of the Star Trek universe? It feels to me like I got to experience something so unique and so special, so few people will ever get to have the journey that I have kind of gone on, growing up with something 
and then getting to participate in it as an adult feeling like you know this circle is completed both for me and for my family you know my friends you know their parents to feel like my extended family you know everybody is aware you know and has been aware of star trek and and my family my mom's relation to it, relationship to it to feel like that circle is complete um, and to even have gotten the opportunity to have that experience, um, I think that's the best part because it's just um, completely unique and completely special and sort of hard to believe in a great way. And you're basically living the childhood dream here. I mean, <laughs> exactly. You know, I, I got to do it and I got to get out before you know, as, as sad as it is to leave, I got to leave before my sort of, uh, it got ruined for me. You know what I mean? I still sort of can approach it with the um, excitement I did when I was younger or the excitement my mom has when she talks about watching the show, you know? So there's something really special about, you know, not having to go through a grind year after year and get to this point where I'm like, oh my God, if I put this damn mask on one more time, I'm going to lose my mind, you know, to feel like I got to almost leave on top, you know, when, you know, not feeling like I was sort of skidding down the other side. It's just, it just is really a, a special thing. Well, as we know, Rin is gone, but Noah is still here. So <laughs> antenna crossed that uh, he will show up again in Strange New Worlds or who knows what else is going to happen in the world of Star Trek. But I'm hoping that we'll see your face pop up again. And hopefully this time your actual face, not one covered in blue makeup. <laughs> you know, I'll take whatever they give me. Anything's possible. And even if it doesn't happen, I'm I'm more than happy with everything that I've gotten to do. Well, Noah, thank you so much for chatting with us today. And again, I just want to thank you on behalf of all the fans for how amazing you have been with the entire community and how much you've embraced it and just taken it in and, and made it, you know, made it a part of yourself. Well, you know, it's always been it's always been a part of myself. I've just finally somebody wants to listen to me now talk about Star Trek and stuff. So uh, it really has been my pleasure. And I'm looking so looking forward to getting to meet everybody at conventions and uh and, you know, if, if there's a question you want to ask me, just tweet at me or DM me on Twitter and I'll, I'll probably answer you. It's true. He's not that hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, well, Noah, again, thank you so much. Been a wonderful time speaking with you today. Appreciate it very, very much. Uh, so until then, live long and prosper. Thanks for having me. And that was our chat with Noah Aberback Katz, who I really enjoyed spending time with and appreciate his willingness to talk about the variety of topics we covered in this hour plus interview. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at N underscore A underscore K to hear more from him and hopefully get some more updates on his D&D sessions. The Andorians first appeared in the original series episode Journey to Babel, where legendary makeup artist Fred Phillips was tasked with designing and executing the look under extremely short notice, essentially creating the look overnight for actors William O'Connell and Reggie Nalder. We wouldn't see an Andorian in a Starfleet uniform until the animated series came out, where we were introduced to Commander Thelen, although technically he was from an alternate universe. While currently not canon, the Deep Space Nine novel Avatar revealed that the Andorians have four sexes, and all four must act together in order to procreate. As you can imagine, Andorian sex ed can get a little complicated, so we're going to save that lesson for another day. So that wraps up this week's episode of Trek Untold. Thank you so much for checking it out this week. Please make sure that you're following us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, all at Trek Untold. That's one word, no spaces, at Trek Untold. It's the best way to get updates on guests, check out all the memes and other things that we're posting, and interact with myself and other Star Trek fans. If you'd like to support this podcast, go ahead and check out patreon.com slash trekuntold and become a subscriber to the show. Or check out teespring.com slash stores slash trekuntold to check out some of our merchandise. If you've been enjoying Trek Untold, please leave us a rating and review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to podcasts. And if you're on YouTube, please give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel, youtube.com slash nerdnewstoday. Leaving ratings, reviews, and comments are things that all help this podcast grow, and they'll cost you nothing but a few seconds of your time. Doing things like that, or even telling your friends or other Star Trek fans about the stuff you've heard on the show and making sure they know about us are huge helps to keeping Trek Untold growing. Thank you once again to our sponsor, Triple Fiction Productions. Go ahead and check them out at triple-fictionproductions.net. If you'd like to send us some feedback about this episode, suggest a guest, or ask to be booked on the show, go ahead and send me an email at trekuntold at gmail.com. 
And of course, thanks to listeners like you for choosing Trek Untold and making it your weekly Star Trek podcast. This has been Trek Untold. I'm Matthew Kaplowitz. And until next time, fortune favors the bold. Trek Untold is sponsored by treksphere.com. Promoting fan-produced Star Trek content in all forms is powered by the RageWorks Podcasting Network and is affiliated with Nerd News Today. 